Hello? All right, let's get started here. And uh, let's stand and sing tonight. Shine, Jesus, shine. Right? Shine, Jesus, shine. First one. All right. Oh, man. I can't read that, guys. <laughs> I don't have my glasses. That's way too small. What? I'll just look this way. <laughs> let's do the do you have do you have it? That's not bad. All right. All right, let's sing. Ready? Just us tonight. We don't got anybody to impress. Ready? Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Place, Spirit, place. Set our hearts on. verse. Ready? Here we go. As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory, place, Spirit, place, set our hearts on fire, flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy, send forth your word. Lord, and let there be light. All right. Well, if you're excited to be here tonight, let me hear you say amen. amen. All right. And the missionaries brought their own, uh, their own fans here tonight. <laughs> it's good to see you guys. Thanks for visiting. And uh, let's go ahead and open up the service in prayer. Brother John Petrucci, 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 would you open us up in prayer, please? <laughs> Amen. It's Sunday night. Be seated. Take your shoes off. I had one of those, uh, I was telling a couple of people, I had one of those naps this, this, this afternoon where you like, you feel like you're coming out of a coma. I'm like, what year is it? And uh, I'm feeling good. So 
I'm, I think I'm going to sit down here in a second and take my shoes off. But anyway, it's just one of those relaxing Sunday night services. He leadeth me. Let's sing He leadeth me. All right? There we go. I can read that. Here we go. Ready? He leadeth me, O oh blessed thought, O oh words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. How many of you have sung this song before? Okay, all right. How many of you have never sung this song before? I can see a couple of you. Couple of you. What? All right, let's try it. Ready? Here we go. Fake it till you make it. Sometimes it seems of deepest room. Sometimes where Eden bowers bloom. By water still or troubled sea, still tis his hand that leadeth me. sing one more tonight. I come broken before Brother Tarwater comes and preaches to us here. I come broken. It starts off with uh, just as I am, and then if you've, the, the chorus is a little bit different, but you'll get it if you've never sang it. Ready? We're good. Ready? Just as Just as 
Listen to this next song. We're going to sing a special for you. If you know it, sing along with us.
Well, it's been a blessing being having the tar waters with us this weekend, and here he is going to come and preach to us now. So, Brother JB, if you'd come. It's good to be back here tonight, and uh, I, I'm not sure they, they came to see me, but they're here tonight anyway. Uh, uh, Pastor David Wilt from Liberty, ba Liberty View Baptist Church and family and some other friends are here tonight. Uh, good to see y'all. Good to see all you guys again tonight. So thanks for allowing me to come back. <laughs> well, if you would, please open your Bibles to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 5. And first of all, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for uh, having us here. Thank you for uh, the wonderful accommodations and all the delicious food and, and fellowship. We've really enjoyed ourselves, so we want to say thank you very much for that. Um, being a missionary now, uh, this is I consider this passage of Scripture to be a missionary story. And so we're going to go through this. We're, we're pretty much going to read the whole thing in, in little, little snippets and uh, see if we can't get a glimpse of what the Lord's trying to show us here in the lives of some of these uh, characters here. Pretty well known, you're probably gonna know some of them, okay? But uh, let's just start here with, uh, if you wanna, I know some people like to have a title to the message. Tonight's message would be, would be called, Now I Know. Now I Know. And if we look right here at uh, the first verse there, it says, Now Naaman, Captain of the host of the king of Syria was a great man. He was very prosperous. We're going to see later on he was very rich. He was a great man. And you know, many in today's society chase after riches, don't they? Greatness and riches. Uh, we have people, in our, people outside of our country fighting to get into our country so that they can have greatness as far as money goes. He was a great man with his master, and Naaman was honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance. And honorable here, uh, if you look at, if, as we go through this story, you're going to see, I, I label it as popular. Because everyone seems to like this guy. Well, his wife likes him, his servants likes him, his slaves like him, his men like him, his king likes him, and so he's a pretty popular guy. So he's prosperous. He's popular. And let's take a look at what else. It says here, he was also a mighty man in valor. Now, that means that he was very powerful. He was very powerful. Now, this is talking about military might because by him, the, the entire nation was delivered by his cunning and skill that God had given him. And so he was a very powerful man in the military. In fact, he was the head of all of the hosts of this nation. In fact, he was also very pop powerful in politics, if you would, because he was always at the right hand of the king. And so he was right next to the king at all times. He was a very powerful man. So he's prosperous, right? He was popular and he was powerful. Now, isn't that what the world wants today? Uh, let's really, before we were saved, isn't that what we wanted? And some of us still today strive for those things of the world. But we're going to find that without the Lord, they're all vain. They're all empty. It's all empty pursuit. And when you leave, you'll have none of it. And so, but here it is, the world. Just think about it. Get, get our heads around this. Everyone that doesn't serve the Lord is striving for these things. And the best place to get them is right here in America. We still have the best opportunities. Although our country is crumbling in many ways, it's still the best beacon of light and hope for the whole world. Amen. And people are coming here, and they are fighting to get here. They'll lie, steal, cheat, sneak, buy their way in. Amen? Am I, am I telling the truth? Yeah. yeah. Why? Because they want these things. Now, some of them do come for religious freedom, and I understand that. And I don't blame them for that. But this is what the world wants. So in the world's eye, this man has got everything, right? He's got it all. And you know what? We look at people like this today, and let's just liken it to somebody today. How about a sports star? Wow, we think they got it all. But have you ever looked at some of their lives? 
Do you know that a lot of these players, they have to make rules so that they won't beat their wives or they can't play or they'll get docked pay? Did you know that? They can't do drugs. They can't do stupid things that's written in their contract or they'll lose their money. So their lives aren't really all that great. How about some kind of musical star, right? Boy, you think the musicians, they have it, right? Have you looked at some of their lives? Uh, even some of the ones that claim to be Christian? I mean, their lives are a mess. How about some of the movie stars, right? Well, we idolize some of these guys, don't we? Let's just be real. If not now, in the past. But have you ever really looked at some of their lives? Divorced seven times? On drugs? In and out of rehab? They're, they are tormented in their mind. Even this year in the Olympics, we saw some folks that were tormented in their mind with fear. And they could not do a task that lasts a few seconds that they had been practicing for their entire life. They're a mess. They're a mess. But this is what the world wants. This is what the world aspires for. Money, fame, wealth, power. And it's all vain unless you know the Lord. And you serve him. And then it can all be used for good. Amen? Amen. Well, this man Naaman did not know the Lord. This man Naaman was powerful. He was prosperous. He was popular. But let's read the last part of the verse. It says, but, there's a contrast here. He had all that that the world seeks, all that that we all want. But he was a leper man. He, had, he was a problem man. You know what his problem was? He was slowly dying of leprosy. Now, do you know what leprosy is? This is a great picture of the lives of those that chase after those things, that aspire for those things, that have those things, but they don't have the Lord. You know what leprosy is? It's a picture of sin. Well, how is it a picture of sin? Well, number one, leprosy will begin to numb you. It'll begin to numb your hand, let's just say your extremity, where you can whack your finger, you can burn it, you can cut it, and you don't feel it. It has a numbing effect. And let me just say to you, in our world today, Entertainment has numbed even the Christian mind and heart away from God. In every facet, I'm, you can include sports in that, that's entertainment. Sports, movies, videos, it has numbed us. Hey, how can some of these kids watch some of these games and all they're doing is shooting people, then they go out and shoot people in their school? You don't think that would have had a numbing effect? How do you think we can watch these things on TV even, I, I hardly even watch sports because I can't, I can't, the commercials are so bad. Now, that's one thing you're driving down the street. I can't help if there's a billboard there. Sometimes I'll try to veer around it. But I can control what I bring into my own face, right? And you know what? These kids grow up with this since they're four years old. I know kids who can do Facebook and, and media better than I ever thought I could. Four and five and six-year-olds. I, I mean, are you all with me? What I'm trying to tell you is, it's numbing our kids to sin. It's numbing us to sin. You see, leprosy has a numbing effect. And so you no longer see things as sin. I remember going to Bible college. And in Bible college, we didn't have any electronics. We couldn't have TV. We couldn't watch anything. You could go to church and watch the preacher. Amen? Amen. And so when I went home, and I went to a good friend's house, a house that I've been to many times, good godly Christian servant in the church, would do anything for you, loved God, went on visitation. They were watching something on TV, a commercial came on, and I had to leave the house. It was so offensive. The music and what was on it was so offensive to me. Because why? Because I had been resensitized. And as I said this morning, when was the last time you heard from, uh, as a whole, in, in Baptist circles, preaching on holiness. We don't hear it anymore. You know why? Because we're numb. Because we're numb. And leprosy has a numbing effect. And you know what else it does? It begins to decay 
and putrefy your body. And that's what the results of numbing will do. That's what the results of leprosy will do. It's going to start to begin to decay and it becomes putrid. And even though we may not see our lives that way, God does. And even others might see it in you. And what does the leper try to do? He tries to wrap it and hide it, right? So we try to hide our sin, right? It doesn't work. God still sees it. Others still see it and smell it. Have you ever known anybody that smoked? My whole family smoked when I was growing up. And they could walk into the room, you could smell it in their clothes. They can't smell it because they're desensitized to it. But I could smell it in their clothes. You see, because sin has this effect of numbing us and then it putrefies, it causes decay in our life, in our spiritual life especially. And it has a putrefying effect that others can see. And so we try to hide it. And then we lie to ourselves, we lie to God, we lie to others about our sin. We come to church and pretend that, oh, I don't have any sin. When, when we're not any closer to holiness than we were when we got saved. Amen? And this is how Naaman is living his life. He's numb. He's numb to God. He wants to be healed, but he doesn't know how. You see, he was, there was sadness in his life, in the life of his family, because he was slowly dying. And as I said this morning, you know, America is slowly dying a spiritual death. Ten churches are closing. Ten churches closed today, by the way. Did you know that? That's a fact. And they'll never reopen here in America. Europe is dead. And America is dying. We need to pray for America. Amen. And we need to start with the next generation. What's going to happen when we're gone? You need that next generation. We need to resensitize them to the things of God. It's not going to be easy. Being holy is not easy on our own, but through the Lord's help, we can do it. Amen. He says, be ye holy for I am holy. That's a command. And so here he is. This is Naaman. He says everything that the world wants, but he has leprosy, which is a picture of sin. And so he has this great problem and this great sadness in his life. But I want to tell you tonight, number one, this is point number one, there's hope. There's hope. I don't mean to bum you out or distress you tonight because there's hope. Amen? Amen. There's hope. Now here is verse number two. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel. Listen to this. A little maid. Now, little there means, can mean small in stature. Okay. It can mean young. But I guarantee you, in the Syrians' eyes, it means insignificant. She was little. You know what? She is a slave to Naaman. And this little maid uh, waited on Naaman's wife. Now, what does it say there? It said, and a band went out of the Syrians. Who's ahead of the Syrians? Naaman. And what did they do? They took her captive. She's now a slave. She no longer has a childhood. She has no toys. There's no playtime. There's no nap time. There's no school. There's no friends. She's a slave. She does what they say, when they say, how they say it, or they can beat her. They can sell her. They can kill her. She's nothing to them. And this little maid is the hero of the story. Can you believe that? Now, how do you feel if somebody treats you wrong? How would you feel if somebody came into your house and killed your dad and your, and your brothers right before your eyes and took you away captive and made you a slave? To another country, you don't even know where you're at. Would you like that guy? No, we don't even like it when pastor don't shake our hand on the way out the door, right? <laughs> we, get, we get offended if somebody doesn't give us a piece of Filipino candy. Right? We get offended at the least little thing. But this little maid had a heart towards God. And didn't hold on to offenses hundreds of years later or decades later or, or ten days later. And this little maid, here's what it says in verse number one. Here's your hope. And she, the little maid, said unto her mistress, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, 
for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be helping Naaman if I was in that situation, if I was a slave. I would be hoping he got worse. Would, come on. In our natural human, right? In our human feelings, that's how we would feel, right? But when God's in the picture, then we can't do that, right? We're supposed to what to our enemies? Love them. Help them. Amen? And so here this little maid, she at her own expense, at the possibility of losing her own life, she spoke up. And she spoke out. Amen? Now sometimes aren't we even afraid to tell our neighbor, invite him to church? Sometimes we're afraid to speak up about Jesus, aren't we? We're afraid at work that somebody won't like us. We're afraid that our family will be upset. We won't even tell them about Jesus. This little maid could have lost her life. This little maid could have been beaten, tortured, sold, killed, anything. But she spoke up anyway. And she spoke out about the Lord. And she said, look, if he was to go down to the prophet, God can heal him. She had great faith, didn't she? Amen. You know, I told you I'd do some tricks tonight for you. So I just want to say, you know what? Uh, let's, I call this the vanishing box. It's just, it's just a box here. But if you put something in, just like if you put your, if you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's never really good per, any perfect illustration to try to illustrate the Lord and salvation, okay? So please understand that, all right? So, but if you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? If you do that, then he will wipe away all your sin. Amen? And it's never to be brought up again. It is as far as the east is from the west. Amen? Now i got to figure out how to get home without any keys. <laughs> But the Lord is so good. And here's the hope. The hope is in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, verse number four. And, and one went in and told his Lord, saying, now, this is really cool. Listen to this. And one went in, this is a servant, heard what the maid said, or the wife told the servant to go well, either way, and went in and told his Lord, Naaman, saying, thus and thus said the maid. That is from the land of Israel. Now, wait a second. <clears throat> if, if, if I said something prophetic and said, hey, you know, uh, to something to somebody, do you, is, is one of you guys going to go tell the president of the United States what J.B. Tarwater said? But this little maid had such a testimony in this house where she was a slave that what she said was taken to the master of the house. And what she said was told to Naaman. Now, where is Naaman? Naaman's at work. Naaman is always next to who? The king. And so here's what it says. She took, the servant took the word of the maid. Wow, does that not blow your mind? What a testimony. Does Na what, who thinks that the president of your country or the president of your company will listen to your advice? Yeah, that's quite the testimony, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, remember, Naaman's rich and wealthy and powerful. He's second in the kingdom. He doesn't have a little tiny house. It's not just him and the maid and his wife. There's all kinds of things going on in his house. And though this maid has such a testimony, and here's what it says, and the king of Syria said, now wait a second, that means the king heard it. And the king respects the little maid. Wow, that's amazing. What a missionary. What a testimony. How powerful is that? That if the President of the United States overheard something one of us said as a missionary, as a representative of Christ, that he took it and went with it. Wow, that'd be something, wouldn't it? Especially if it had to do with God. And the, and, and the king of Syria said, go to go. He's telling Naaman, go, do it. You know why? Because he loves Naaman. His wife likes him. The little maid likes him. The servant likes him. The king likes him. This guy's popular. And he says, go to, go right now. And I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. Now listen. So the king of Syria is now writing a letter of recommendation for Naaman to the king of Israel based on the word of a little maid who doesn't even have a name, who is a slave. Wow, 
what a testimony. You think she lived a holy life? She's powerful. Naaman's not powerful. She's powerful because her God has given her such a testimony that the kings of the world pay attention to her advice. Wow. Who here would like to have a testimony like that? Yeah, I, I wish that people on the street would just listen to me. Amen. <laughs> and so here we go. Go to go. And right here in the middle of verse number five. And he, Naaman, departed. Now get this. And he took with him ten talents of silver. I'm going to break this down for you to modern day money. Ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold. Well, that alone should tell you this is a lot of money. Six thousand pieces of gold and ten chains of raiment. You know how much that is in modern day terms? That's about 380 $3.85 million. Let's just, can we round it up to $4 million today with interest? Inflation? Hmm? $4 million. Can you imagine this? In coin, right? So I, I picture him as having a limo chariot, okay? And so he takes all this coin, he puts it in the back of his limo chariot, you know, and he's got this limo chariot, and he's got these big horses and all of his men, and yeah. And all that change is jingling back there, and he's heading out in all of his regal apparel. Can you see this? This is like cool, right? Four million dollars. Because he wants to buy his healing. Now, can we buy healing? <laughs> so here he is, he heads out with his, with, with his limo chariot. <laughs> And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I therewith sent Naaman, my servant, this is the king talking to the king, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Now, can the king of Israel heal anybody? And it came to pass, in verse 7, it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes. You know what that is? That's a sign of distress. They would, rent their, they would tear their outer garment and the whole kingdom would realize it would ripple through the kingdom very fastly. The king's in distress. The country's in distress. There's distress. He rent his clothes and he said, Am I God? Well, that's a true statement, isn't it? Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Look. Naaman was sad, his wife was sad, the little maid was sad, the servants were sad, the king was sad, and now this king is sad, <laughs> right? So there's sadness through the whole land here. But we're going to see that there's hope, and we're going to see in a second that there's help. Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see, he seeketh a quarrel against Here's what he's saying. He says, look, he sent his best man with his best men to come in and require something I can't do, and now they're going to probably try and kill me and take over the kingdom. This is what he was thinking. He was scared. He was scared. But here comes the help. Point number two. Here's the help. Verse number eight. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him, Naaman, come now to me, and he shall know. That there is a prophet in Israel. He said, King, what are you so worried about? Send Naaman to me, just like the little maid said, and I will show him that there is a God that can heal him. Amen? So there's the help. The help is on its way. So, verse number nine. So Naaman came, look at this, with his horses, and his, it's not written in here, but I think it's limo chariot, limousine chariot, and his chariot. And he stood at the door of Elisha. Now, he's been invited. Now, can you see this? He rides up, dun, 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 and dust flies, and jingling back there in his limo chariot. And he jumps off of his regal apparel, maybe even has a sword. And he walks up, and he knocks on the door. <coughs> and he's expecting the prophet to come out to him. But instead, he sends the lawn boy. Now, I say that because I used to be a lawn boy. He sends a little servant. And what does happens here? And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Now, wait a second. If you had invited the president to your house, and he came to your house, and you sent the little lawn boy to him, and told him, Go wash yourself before I'll see you, 
Would, would that be an insult? Would he be happy to come all that way? I don't think so. He'd not be happy at all. Name is not happy. But he's given a very simple command here. What is it? Go and wash and you'll be clean. Do you know what God expects, boys and girls? You know what? You know what? There's really only one thing that God expects of a boy and girl. Do you know what it is? It's what the Bible says. It's from the Bible. It's a four-letter word. It starts with O. Obey. Obey. Boys and girls, that's all God expects you to do is to obey. And guess what? Since we're his children, adults, he expects that from us too. He says, if you love me, what? Keep my command. So what are we supposed to do? Just obey. And here's a simple command. And God gives us simple commands. And we can't seem to obey those, huh? And we're looking for some great thing to happen. But we can't obey the very simple thing of being faithful and being a witness. Amen? And being holy. And we want God to do a miracle. But we want to do the very basic commands that he gives us. He has no obligation if we're not going to obey the simple commands, right? You don't have any power in your spiritual life? Just obey and see what God would do. And Elisha sent the messenger and he said, go wash yourself. Now, number 11, but Naaman was wroth. Now, this doesn't just say he was mad. He was wroth. You know what that is? That's like foaming at the mouth, <laughs> mad. He is mad. He is wroth. And he went away and he said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of his Lord, his God, and strike his hand over this place and recover the leper. Now that's, that's pretty wild, isn't it? That's what he says. Those are his words. Now where does he get this crazy idea that he's going to call down fire or something and strike? God, recover his leprosy standing right there with some kind of bolt of lightning or something. Where does he get that idea? Does anybody know? Well, this is Elisha. Who was the prophet before Elisha? Elijah. What did Elijah do on Mount Carmel? He called fire down from heaven. And it consumed stone and rock and water and bone and flesh. Poof, gone. You know what else happened? When a very arrogant king sent 50 men with a captain... And said, hey, you come down here and see the king. And the prophet said, okay, if I'm a prophet, fire will come down from heaven. And it did. And it went, Phew! and it liked up, Phew! disintegrated those 50 with the captain. And so the king sent another captain with 50. Same thing. Phew! And so the king then sent another 50. He, he's a slow learner. <laughs> sent another captain with 50, right? But that captain was smart. And he knelt down and said, excuse me, sir, uh, Mr. Prophet. <laughs> Would you please come with us? <laughs> and he spared his life. Do you think this soldier heard about those soldiers? Yeah. Do you think he heard about the lightning coming down or, or, or the fire from heaven on Mount Carmel? I think the whole world at that time heard about that. Don't you? That's the only way I can think that he would come up with such a fanciful idea. And so he pictured giving him $4 million and he would, lightning would come down and heal him. He was expecting some kind of fabulous miracle. But he was just told simply to obey something simple. And I think we get ourselves in those type of situations too, don't we? Verse number 12. He went from sadness to madness. Now he's mad. And, uh, and he said, are not the rivers of Damascus better than the Jordan? Well, they may have been. They were cleaner. He's probably thinking, if I dip in that Jordan, I'm going to make it worse, not better. And verse 13, but later on, and he went away in a rage, it says. Now, you know what a rage is? That's when the veins are popping and the steam shooting out. That's how he rode away. Has anybody ever seen anybody like that? Is that the time to reason with them? I, I think we should talk about, oh boy, that's hard to reason with somebody in that state, isn't it? So they let him cool down, and his men came to him, in verse 13, and his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, now wait a second, is he all their dad? No, he's not their dad. They say my father out of respect. This is a lesson, boys and girls, right here on how to speak to those in authority. With respect. Especially if you're wanting them to do something. Okay, If you go, hey, I want this, that ain't going far. 
Oh, excuse me, Mom, Dad, would you pray about this? No? Different approach. My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean? They said, hey, you would have fought men. You would have given $4 million. You would have taken over a kingdom. You would have done anything. And all he asked you to do was wash. Now, here's one of the reasons why I think Naaman was like. He was reasonable. And he said, okay, I'll do it. He wasn't stubborn and fixing his way. And so in verse number 14, here here's, comes number three, and this is the healing. There was hope, help, and healing. And that's what we all need. That's what the world needs. In verse number 14, Then went he, Naaman, down and dipped himself, how many times? Seven times in the Jordan. Now, I don't think, do you think, I, don't, I personally don't believe every time he came up, he was one-seventh better healed. I think when he came up that last time, that as he came up, he was healed as he came out of that water because it's by faith and obedience. What if he only done it six times? Do you think he would have been six-seventh healed? He would have been just like the time he got here. And so it says here, he obeyed and he dipped himself seven times. Accor Listen, according to the saying of the man of God, this is called obedience to God and is what is commanded. And his flesh came again like unto him, the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Ladies, let me ask you something. Would you like to have that regiment? Hmm? You, go you go dip in your bathtub or shower seven times, and you're like, oh, I'm like 12 years old skin again. Woohoo! Wow, that would sell, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'd bottle that up. Because you can only imagine he's, he's, he's accomplished, so he's got to be around maybe 40, I'm just guessing, right? And so he's probably got scars. He's a, broken, he's, a, he's a warrior. He's all messed up, and he's got leprosy to boot. But he came out of there, he was like a new child. Now that's a picture of what? Salvation. Whereas leprosy is a picture of sin, this is a picture of salvation. Because he obeyed, he put his faith in a simple command, and he was healed. Amen? Now, how do I know that he, that, well, number one, he was healed, but number two, he changes. Before he wanted to buy and see some great miracle and expectations that were ridiculous and unwarranted. But now, he doesn't want to buy, but he wants to bless. Let's look at this. And he, verse number 15, no, wait, verse number 15. And he returned to the man of God, which he did not have to do, and all his company, and came and stood before him. Now Elisha sees him. And Naaman said, Behold, what? Now I know. He didn't know before. Now he knows. And what does he know? That there is no other God in all the world except for the God of Israel. What's that called? That's called faith, amen? This man's heart changed. He didn't, he thought he needed new skin. You know what he needed? A new heart. And here it is in verse 16. Uh, he says, now I know in verse, in verse 15, he says, there is no God in all but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee take a, what? Does that say a buying or a purchase? No, it says a blessing of thy servant. He still, he was already healed. He didn't have to go back. He could have kept his $4 million, but he said, you know what? Now I want to bless you. Do you know what is in the heart of someone who's been truly healed by the Lord God? They want to bless. They want to give. That should flow out of us. If nothing else does, that should flow. We should not have tight wallets and tight purses and things like that. Let me bless you. Amen? Because who would get the blessing here? It'd really be... Naaman, right? And so he wants to bless. He wants to give. In verse 16, But Elisha said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he, urged him to, and, and he Naaman, urged him, Elisha, to take it. But he, Elisha, refused. You know why? I believe, this is my own thought, I believe, he didn't want Naaman getting confused that you can buy. And did Elijah trust in money? He trusted in God. Now, I got 
two minutes, and I want to do a contrast here of Naaman being having leprosy in a picture of sin, and he was sad, and then he got mad, and then he got glad. Amen? Now he's glad, right? And now let's contrast with somebody who doesn't have faith to someone who does, Gehazi. Gehazi, for all practical purposes, has faith. He is a servant of Elijah. He is a, an assistant to Elijah. He is in church, and he's around, and he's there, and he's serving God. So he's glad, right? He's okay. Let's see what gets us off track as those that already have faith. Look at this, verse 19. And he said unto him, go in peace. Okay, that's what he said. Now, verse 20, but, okay, here's the contrast. Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said, behold, my master has spared Naaman the Syrian and not receiving of his hands. That's what she brought. He brought $4 million. I want some. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. You know what he said? My master messed up. He should have taken some of the money. But I know better than my authority. I will go get some of that money. And he went, and he, I, because of time, I'm just going to tell you the story. You can read it, okay? And he went, and as he, as he ran after Naaman, Naaman jumped off and said, what can I do? And listen, you know what? He would have killed, he would have fought, he would have done anything for those guys, right? And he said, oh, 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 oh we're, we're going to have some visitors. We're having some preachers and prophets and missionaries come, and we need to take care of them. Uh, how about, oh, a tithe, 10%. And Naaman said, oh, no, take 20. Well, somebody tell me, what is 20% of $4 million? About $800,000. And so it took men to help him because it was so heavy. And he carried it and he hid it. And then he walked in where Elisha was like nothing happened. And Elisha says, hey, where you been? He goes, oh, I've been nowhere. Okay, so what happens here? When he gets his eyes off of God and he got his eyes on the world. Remember, Naaman has what all the world wants. Boys and girls, I'm trying to help you here. Get your eyes off the world and get it on God because it's going to mess you up. And what you're going to do is next thing you know, you're going to be trying to hide your sin. This process goes on every time you see sin. Follow it out. Look at it. You hide it. And then when you're questioned about it, uh, Elisha says, you know what? No, it was revealed to me. When you chased after him, you broke my heart. You broke my heart when you took that money, Gehazi. And now there's a penalty to pay. God cannot let that go. You lied to them. You lied to me. You tried to hide it. And what happens when we try to hide it and it doesn't work? Then we what? Lie about it. And we can trick ourselves into believing that we're holy when we're not. And we can wallow in sin and think that we're clean. Satan is a master deceiver. He'll trick you in every step. And you got leprosy all over us. We need to get rid of the leprosy. We need to be healed. As I'm talking as a nation, okay? Please don't understand I'm pointing out any single person. If I was, it would be me. And we need to be healed. And we need to be holy. Amen? Amen? And if we do those things, you know what God says? He will heal our land. You want COVID to go away? Then let's all the Christians be holy. Amen? And COVID will go away. That's what the Bible says. He'll heal our land. Right? Churches will stop closing. And so here it is. So here's a man of God that knows God, that serves God. And he has got his eyes on the world. And now he's hiding his sin. He's lying about his sin. But there is a penalty that has to be paid. And here's what it is. In verse 27, the leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee, Gehazi, and unto thy seed forever. And Gehazi went out from his presence a leper, white as snow. He was glad when he didn't get what he wanted from the war. When he saw something and he didn't like the decision of his authority, he got mad. And now he's sad. It's a reversal. And not only that, but let me just tell you this, men and women, boys and girls, when we sin, it doesn't just affect us. 
It's affected his entire family. It affects your testimony. It affects your church. It affects your family. And not only that, his entire family had leprosy the rest of forever. Unless God changed this curse, which I don't know about. Because I can show you in the New Testament where it says there was only one person in the Old Testament that was healed of leprosy. In the Old Testament, that was healed of leprosy. And you know who it was? Naaman. That's it. Now, the New Testament, Jesus did heal people. But in the Old Testament, it says the men of old, there was only one that was healed. And I believe that's in James. No. Uh, I will find that for you, find that verse. But it's in the New Testament. Luke 4. Luke 4, 27. My wife knows. She's heard me preach this. <laughs> Luke 4, 27. Naaman's the only one. And so this, the, this family was a leper forever. If, they're, if he has descendants alive today, they're lepers today. Did you know that leprosy is rampant in India right now? It's not gone. Sin's not gone. But here's what I want to tell you. There's hope. There's help and there's healing. Amen? Amen. And you don't have to walk around sad and mad. You can be glad. Amen? Thank you very much. So let's, let's be more like the little maid. No matter how we're treated, no matter what we have. She had nothing. He had everything. And who was blessed? She was. Amen? All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you for having us. Remember, your life is like a vapor. It appears for a little time. There you go. <laughs> and then vanisheth away. So serve the Lord now. Don't wait till later. Get things out of our life that shouldn't be there. And uh, be holy. Amen? And let God heal our land. Amen. Appreciate it. I, I think that's like his his trademark. He's ended he's ended both services now with that. I need, I told I told him at lunch this afternoon. It's like it was so seamless this morning. He like got that out and lit it and whew, and just kept on talking and nobody went ooh nobody like nobody flinched. Everybody's like okay this is normal. There's just flame, you know, <laughs> at the end of the service. And I'm like I need a trademark like that at the end of you know some. <laughs> Like a flamethrower. You're all dismissed or so. I don't know. <laughs> but um, but if that was a blessing to you, say amen. amen. And uh, Brother Bruce, if you'd come, we're going to take a quick offering again. We uh, want to take care of Brother JB and, uh, and his ministry there, and I appreciate that. I don't know. Watching that video this morning, with uh, I was talking to him more about the, the street children, and uh, uh, that's just really does something to you, you know, and uh, we were talking about that a little bit at lunch, and I wish, I wish we had a million dollars to give them, really, um, and it still wouldn't even scratch the surface of what, what needs to be done, so let's be a blessing any way we can. Dear Lord, I pray, Father, you would bless the tar waters as they uh, move on to the next uh, church here and um, present their ministry and their burden. I pray, Father, that you would speed them on their journey, give them safety. And, Lord, I pray that um, you would bless their ministry and help them to be able to get to the Philippines fully funded in December. Lord, I, I pray that they would be able to reach thousands of kids for you. And, Lord, that you would um, just, uh, again, have the, the divine wind of blessing at their back and um, uh, just like you you prospered Joseph and everything that he did Lord I pray Father that you would do that with them as well and bless them a, a, as they're faithful to you and as they've dedicated themselves to serving you Lord I, I pray Father that you would um, just bless us now as we have a chance to uh, participate in that and Lord we sure do love you thank you for loving us and dying on the cross and making it all possible. Thank you for your forgiveness from the leprosy of sin that we're all, we're all, uh, uh, we're all guilty of, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray all these things. Amen. All right. Normally we'd have music or something, but that was, that was Lori. She dropped the ball completely on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a quick uh, testimony? Quick testimony off the uh, off top of your head, Jimmy? Oh. Testimony.
testimony about camp. Anything coming on? Junior camp this last week? preacher talked about David and Goliath and how he wouldn't have even been in that situation were it not for his obedience to his parents. And uh, I thought that was a really good thought. And uh, so I stole that idea and preached it to the kids in junior church today. <laughs> an independent Baptist preacher unless you've stolen at least like a couple of outlines. So, all right, uh, let's stand to our feet and we'll be dismissed tonight. Um, uh, brother, um, Steve, sorry, total, I'm still waking up. Brother Steve, would you dismiss us in prayer tonight? <laughs>